Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto sucedo ye olahudi samyao samputoshi. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Qian Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in hundreds of thousands of millions of eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it, Within my sight and hearing, I bow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture tonight. It's the 13th of September, and we're here in Berkeley, California. It's a Saturday night. We're going to look into the Ten Grounds chapter, the Sixth Ground, and we'll start by invoking the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, here on the front cover, if you want to turn to your text, let's do that together. Namo da fang guang fo kwa yen ji Kwa yen hai hui fo pu sa na Da fang guang fo hua yen jing Hua yen hai hui o pu sa na Da fang guang fo hua yen jing Hua yen hai hui o pu sa na Ta fang guang fo hua yen jing Hua yen hai hui fo pu sa na Ta fang guang fo hua yen jing Hua yen hai hui fo pu sa na mo Da fang guang fo hua yen jing Hua yen hai hui fo pu sa Please turn in your text to page 6 and 7. I was wondering why the, the last row on the women's side looks so far away. And I realized that people put out a row of four seats instead of five. Isn't that funny how I get used to seeing people at a certain size and, and now we're pushed back because we've only got four. That's, so that's all right. It's just, you know, it's okay. I, I'll make sure that you're still there. Okay. It's good. It's like sometimes we don't get this last line of lights turned on and I'm looking and it's darker. What's got all the light? Wait, so you get uh, used to certain parameters here. And subtle variations throw you off. Page 6 and 7 and we're down at the very bottom of page 6. This is the sixth ground and I'm amazed that we actually got here. Tonight is a, a significant moment in the sixth ground because it brings out some themes that are uh, uniquely Mahayana Buddhist. I'll tell you why when we get there. Okay, we're on uh, at the very bottom, Pusa Rushi Guan Yi Chie Fa, down below. Okay, at the very bottom, two lines from the bottom, here we go. 
菩萨如是，观一切法，自信清净，随顺无为。得入第六，现前地，得名利，随顺忍，未得无生法忍。All right, over to the right. Read with me together. Thus, the Bodhisattva contemplates how the inherent nature of all dharmas is pure. He flows along with it and does not oppose it, and he gains entry into the sixth stage, that of manifestation. He realizes two qualities of patience: the patience of clarity and the patience of according. But he has not yet realized patience when dharmas no longer arise. Last week.、Uh, The key to understanding what's going on here is in our description of this text as a science text. This is just like a biology text because it's talking about the human human being's inner workings. It could be called a physics text because it's talking about the nature of reality,、um, and both of those. Are about as far away as you can get from what you might call a religious scripture. People think of religious scriptures as somehow what what do we think? What do we want when we get to a religious scripture? We want to a feeling of、mm, something that carries us out of the world, maybe takes us to heaven, perhaps.、Uh, religious scripture should should give us a, f- a sense of God, that's or the some supreme creator being. Where we touch something、um, that only maybe maybe it's this way maybe the scripture is supposed to give us the eyes of a saint. So we listen to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John talk about Jesus. That would be a scripture. Or in the Holy Quran, we hear about heaven. You know, what's heaven like? A description of heaven. And the suit our Avatamsaka d- definitely has that. You can find that there. That's not what we got tonight. The sixth ground, the sixth stage, is taking us with a microscope into our own minds and into the world. And the other thing we said last week was it's like lifting the hood on the universe. And I went into a long description of what it was like growing up in the Midwest in the 50s and 60s and living in a car culture. And the car culture、uh, that my brother and I were in, and then my sister. Later, it had to do with being able to identify cars. We'd look out the window and be able to spot Fords and Chevys and every GM car and every Ford car、uh, with the model. You know, then when when compact cars came in, we were able to identify compact cars unerringly. And then when I got my my Volkswagen,、uh, that was the time when you were supposed to repair your own Volkswagen. That was the culture that I was in. And a guy named John Muir, not the John Muir who discovered Yosemite, not the the great、uh, father of of the、uh, the Sierra Club, not that John Muir, but another John Muir, this guy, the hippie with a beard, who、uh, had published a book, extremely popular, called How to Fix Your Own Volkswagen, How to Fix Your Own Beetle Bug, and I devoured that book, and we did. So we lifted the hood on the Volkswagen, and. Some people we mentioned. Some people relate to their car as a key, a gas pedal, and a steering wheel. And there's a windshield in front of you, and you try not to hit anything as you go down the road. That's pretty much all you care about is turning it on and turning it left and right, making it go, making it stop, shut the door. You're fine. Where's the cup holder? Where's the FM? Okay, that's good enough. But that's not turning the. That's not lifting the hood, right? If you lift the hood, you want to find out what's inside. You. Lift the hood because you want to see the pistons go up and down, and you want to see the valves go in and out, and you want to see the carburetor mix the gas and the air, and you want to see the crankshaft turn, and you want to see the flywheel turn, and you want to see the the differential send that turning energy out to each wheel, and like that, you know, make sure it's all lubricated and 
That's, that's what it means to lift the hood on the universe. You see how it's working. You see it in action. That's what our sutra does. That's what's going on here. It's an actual live uh, microscopic engineer's view of what happens in our lives. Not just our lives, but the things around us. That's what's going on here. That's really what it's like. And it's so different from what we kind of assume a sacred scripture would be like. Because we're waiting for the, the devas to fly by and the harps to play and the clouds and the flowers, you know. And it's not that. It's talking about what? It's talking about how to tear your world apart and not go crazy. Dramatic silence while those words sink in. What did he say? Was he saying something? The bodhisattva, as he or she looks at the world, rips it apart down to the level where there's nothing left. But what are you ripping apart? You're ripping apart your world and your mind. And you're supposed to not freak out. That's what the bodhisattva's patience allows him or her to do. Very different than than religious scriptures that I'm familiar with. But I really like it. And the question is, how much of it can we take? I came armed with a 12-string guitar and pictures. Because why? This is strong medicine. You can take about 10 minutes of it, and then you go, <coughs> reliably, people zone out after a while. The, the deeper it goes, the less we're able to absorb it. Why? It's, it challenges your ability to to absorb. It really does. Okay. So am I I'm giving you this preamble before we actually touch the text because I think it helps to understand what's going on. Um, the Buddha gave this text not to beginners. Okay? It's not a beginning text. If we are just starting with this, it will make very little sense. And it will seem to not connect to anything. Who in the world talks like this? Well, advanced meditators talk like this. People who are ready to see it this way because their own experience has shown them this. The Buddha is not selling books. He's not on a world book tour hoping that we'll buy a copy, you know, or get the Kindle version or the PDF. The Buddha is saying, oh, by the way, uh, you're going to take that next step, you better learn this, because why? It's a long way down. You're flying very high. And if you go wrong, you're going to, number one, you might quit, because it's too weird. Number two, you might get stuck somewhere out in the far reaches of your mind and not be able to recognize the road back. Uh, three, and this happens a lot, you might think you're enlightened and go wrong that way. You might really love it and just attach to it and not want to come back and uh, it's not right either. So, tricky stuff, right? That's what's going on here in the, in the sixth ground. S some of you will be intrigued by that. S that will be fun for some of us. Others of us will go, you know, I gave up a movie night for this nonsense. You know, <laughs> Maybe it's not too late. Maybe I can get the late showing. What was it? It was over at the Shattuck Theater. You know, I'll go, catch the 9.30 show. Let's hope he ends it early tonight so we can get over there before the movie starts. Save me some popcorn. Okay, now that I've, if I've played it like that for you, what if I can't deliver? Let's see. Let's see if, it, if, if you get what I'm saying. Pusa Rushi, the Bodhisattva, like this, this is how the Bodhisattva Guan yi qie fa zi xing qing jing. Guan verb, looks at, contemplates. To contemplate means you look at something with your mind's eye. There's a lot of ways to look at things. Where do you, what's the point of looking? The point of looking is seeing. You want pictures to happen. If you see but you shut your eye, if you look but you shut your eyes, you won't see. You'll see dark, not seeing, but it's dark. You want pictures to happen. So where do these pictures happen? Not behind your eye. 
They happen in your mind's eye. Now, where's that located? You, you tell me. You know, the Buddha and Ananda went round and round and round about where the pictures happen when you look with your mind's eye. Where you look with your physical eye, where does it happen? Well, it's got to be here because when I cover this, it doesn't make any difference to my seeing. So it's not here. It must be here. But what about your mind's eye? Where do those pictures happen? Is the question. So that's what guan means. You look with your mind's eye. In other words, you contemplate. Another good translation for what that means is you visualize. Now, if we wanted to go in there, I mean, that could be the end of the lecture right now. We could talk about, can you visualize without seeing? Yeah. What are dreams? A dream is a, seems real. You see it with your mind's eye, but you're asleep. So clearly your eyes and your head are not operating, but you see it clearly. So there's something going on here. The Bodhisattva Guan contemplates. In other words, the pictures happen, but he or she is not necessarily looking with his or her eyes. Okay, so that, that's an important difference here. Guan Yi Chie Fa. Dharmas, small d dharmas. That's talking about the things of the world, phenomena. This is, here on my little table, I have a variety of phenomena to, uh, to point to. And I, I always have these nice flowers, because the flowers come. What are these called? Do we know? Irises and something else. Okay, so these, this is the something else. Little delicate green stuff and irises. <coughs> so, these purple irises are dharmas, small d dharmas. But it's not a single dharma, it's a whole collection. For example, color is a dharma. In this case, it's purple. Shape is a dharma. Size is a dharma. All these different qualities, right? Phenomena is kind of the collective in English. All the different phenomena connected with flowers. Okay, what about it? Yichie fa. Zi xing qing jing. Oh boy. Zi xing qing jing. Zi xing, inherent nature, own nature, self nature, intrinsic nature. All these different attempts in English to render what zi xing means. And it's such a central word in Buddhism that an entire school of Buddha's teaching grew up around the school of the nature, they call it, right? And I had a, a friend in the Sangha, some of you, I don't know if anybody, anybody meet Hong Ju, Tim Testu? Hong Ju, Da Ju, the first Sambu we buy. Anybody ever meet him? Am I the only one who knew Testu? Guess nobody did, yeah, so. You're all too young. Hung Ju was a former submarine diver for the Navy. If you tried out for the SEALs, the Navy SEALs, and didn't, didn't get to the SEALs, you could still be the toughest guy in town if you were the, a submarine's diver. And he was a, so when the, was it the Rock? The USS Rock went out and they had trouble? Send him. Right? He gets into his scuba suit and goes out the hatch and deals with it. You know, this is one tough, rough individual. And he said, Hong Ju said, the only person in his life he met who could ever subdue him, this is the only person he ever met who was tougher than he was Master Hua. Tim Testu was a Scorpio and displayed all the best and the worst qualities of Scorpio. Couldn't subdue him, except Shifu. And so, that's a kind of Tim. So, never mind, we'll talk about him some other day. But he had a way, he had a saying that I never heard anybody else use so well. And he was, you know, being a ship's diver, you have to know welding underwater, light the torch, weld, crack in the submarine hull, you got to weld in it. You have to be able to kill a shark with a knife. <laughs> you, know, you have to be able to kill a person with your fingers. You know, 
he had a bunch of skills, right? So Tim Testu, a uh, bhikshu hung Jew, was always saying this phrase. He would say, you just do it according to its nature, he would say. He was a baker. He could bake. And I would go, eh, how do you get this? And I, and there's yeast and then, you know, sh- ugh, sugar and flour. He'd say, you just do it according to its nature, he would say. Oh, that explains it. You just do it according to its nature. He would say that about anything. Fixing a car, baking bread, you know, stealing the admiral's yacht in, Phil- in Manila Harbor and taking it for a joyride and getting busted and thrown in the brig for, you know, but then the rock had to leave and they, had, they sprung him out of jail because they had to go. And, you know, do it according to its nature, he would say. So, what does that mean? You do it according to its nature. Well, Xing, the nature of all dharmas is pure. How about that for Buddhist code language? Take that one home tonight. What did you learn at the monastery? Well, we learned that the self-nature of all dharmas is pure. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. What does that mean? The self-nature of all dharmas is pure. Mm. Why am I snarking at that? It's because on the face of that sentence, it makes no sense. What in the world could that mean? Self-nature is not pure? What's the self-nature? What's the zi xing? Big question. That's why we're on the sixth ground. That's why I've never tried to lecture this before. Because we bump up against the nature and there's a contradiction. Which is what? What's the nature of wood? Here we've got a very outstanding example of wood. Ebony wood. Hard. Right? Hard ebony. Here's another. Hard. This is probably oak. This might be pine. So, wood. What's its nature? Well, if you talk about its chemical makeup, we know one thing. In the presence of fire, it changes. You apply fire to it, it turns to ash, and it flares and it's gone. It disappears in the presence of fire. So that's one thing you've learned about it. Right? Another thing is that it comes from a living thing. That's its nature. So what's the nature of wood? You can analyze it down to what hydrocarbons, water, fiber, and hollow. Because nature, wood, draws water up through it, draws sap up through it. That's interesting, right? You know a little bit about its nature. But how far can you go with that? Well, elemental things, metal. You can look at the nature of metal. The nature of gold is different than the nature of iron. They're both elemental compounds, right? But what what if you apply it to something complex like your mother, your father. What's the nature of your father? He's a dharma. My God, I can't even begin. You know, he's so complicated. He's so unex- inaccessible. You know. And so, this phrase is loaded with meaning. This is what is it in a word? What do we say in real life? We say that's deep. That's deep. This, the nature of all dharmas is pure. So here I, you know, I'm the lecturer tonight. Hello, I'm your lecturer this evening. Have you seen the menu? You know, would you like drinks? So here I am stuck with the job of explaining all dharmas, self-nature, pure. Come on, give me a break. Let's sing a song. Okay, now we're turning to music at this point. The self-nature of all dharmas is pure. What in the world could that mean? You know, think about it. Okay, first of all, self-nature, I think that's not an effective translation. I think nature gives us closer, but
But the problem is, capital N nature refers to what? The world before humans develop it, something like that. Outdoors is kind of nature. Capital N, Mother Nature. We know about that. We can find it. We go out to the park. There's nature, right? Weather, that's nature. Capital N. Okay, we're, we're close. We got that. We know what that means. Everybody agrees on that. What about small n, nature? Is that what's meant by this? Yeah. So, what if we say small n, the nature of all dharmas? Mm. The... The Chinese translator translated this as zi xing because they were rendering a Sanskrit word called svabhava. Svabhava. I'm not going to name any names, but all you hotshot Buddhist studies scholars, please wake up out of your samadhi and give me a quick definition of svabhava. They put their glasses on. Okay grab for their iPhones. Let's see, Wikipedia, Svabhava. It says, what is Svabhava? And what you discover really quickly is, not easy. Not easy. Why? It's not on the surface. That's why it's hard. Okay? It's not excluding the surface either, but it's not something your senses can tell you. That's why this is hard. Which sense are you going to rely on to explain the nature of that wooden fish or the irises? Your eyes going to tell you about the nature? No. Your ears going to tell you about the nature? No. Nose, tongue, body, mind, not by themselves. That's the problem right there. When you say nature, You've got to go past the surface. You've got to go inside. How do you do that? The answer to the question is in the sentence we already looked at. Guan. The Bodhisattva, Guan, lets the pictures appear inside. That's where you see the self-nature. In other words, wisdom sees the self-nature, not your senses. Remember our early condition? This is taught by the Buddha for meditators. People whose samadhi, whose wisdom, is already able to go past the surface of stuff. Tell me about the nature of your dad. Well, sometimes he's in a bad mood. Other times he writes poetry. He's angry a lot, but he's also always there, dependable. You know, so like, which one of those qualities you described gives me a picture of your dad? I get a feel for him, but it's not how he looks. It's how he is inside. Oh, so we're guan, we're looking at the nature of all dharmas inside, right? Are we closer? I think that's actually helpful, right? Because why the verb, what the bodhisattva does is he lets the pictures happen inside of how things are past the surface of things. Okay? I think we're on to something. We're closer here. Otherwise, how are you going to explain the self-nature of all dharmas is pure? Blah, blah. That's nonsense unless you take it from what experience. This is not theoretical. This is not philosophy. When you get to the nature, you have to, if you really want to understand what the Buddha is saying, you have to experience it. And at this point in the Buddha's teaching, his disciples did, his audience did. They were quiet inside, so when they sat still, the pictures came about what things were past their surface. Funny, huh? So can you imagine who was the first inventor of the microscope? It was a guy named von Leeuwenhoek, right? All you history of science majors, correct? Von Leeuwenhoek was the inventor of the... Clearly, 
He was Dutch. He's probably a <coughs> an optician. He probably a, he was able to make lenses. So you take a drop of water. You've all done this if you remember your science class. You take a drop of water. You put it on a slide. And if you stand back, it's a drop of water on the slide. You look through that microscope and you go, tweet, 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 and suddenly you go, oh my God, there's a thousand bugs inside that drop of water. They're swimming around. They're looking at me. They're waving at me. They're giving me the finger. What are you, hey, what are you doing? You shouldn't do that. It's not polite. You're going to drink me. So, yeah, look at that. Inside that drop of water, there's all these critters swimming around, having fun. You didn't know that from the outside till you applied the microscope. Okay, you don't know the self-nature of all dharmas until you apply the microscope of wisdom through your meditation. Same. Same. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, I'll stop beating that. So, he looks at the probably self-nature, not going to work, the inherent nature. That's okay because it's got in, in there, meaning it's inside. Intrinsic nature, yeah, kind of. Meaning something possessed inside that you don't get until you go past the surface. Intrinsic, inherent, uh, self-nature, nah. Self-nature is not a good translation. Inherent nature of all phenomena is, we finally got to that last adjective, what? Pure. What does it mean, pure? I think it means can't, can't hang on to anything. No attribute you can know it by. No name, and that's, that's a major attribute that we have. I was fumbling with this until we got the word iris. And these are iris. Mostly it's flowers, purple flowers. Okay, what's an attribute? Well, the name is a major attribute. As soon as you have a name, not pure. As soon as you have a price, it's not pure. Why? Because those attributes are external things. You stick on them. They don't belong to it. What really belongs to all dharmas is the absence of any handles. Can't grab them. Now, okay, every, t every one of these words could be the whole lecture. We could stop right there. Because if we think about what that means is, you don't have a name. I don't fundamentally have a name. The name is a convention. I was given my name by my parents and then by my teacher. The name that I've used for 39 years, 38 years now, is not the name that I had before. Which one was real? The answer is, the nature of all dharmas is pure. None. Because there's nowhere for it to stick. The name that your mom sews onto your, the label on, that you get sewed onto your gym bag, or the stick it or post it or the sharpie that you use to write your name on stuff. Anybody have an engraved iPhone? If you get a new iPhone 6, they will engrave it for free. You know. So, is that name forever and forever on your iPhone 6? Yeah, is, is that you? That thing is stuck to you, you know. You're never more than about a foot away from it for the rest of its life. So, yeah. Dharmas, in fact, the essence, the, the nature of all dharmas has no labels anywhere. They're always shifting and going away. They're always going away. So uh, today, uh, Nam and uh, Guo Ji and uh, Jin Fo Shi and I and, and uh, Eric Jia went down to Highway 9 to our cabin to work on the bridge down there because we're going to pave the road. I got some pictures later you can see. You can get to see a banana slug crawl across the screen. We'll invite a banana slug. The, the inherent nature of all banana slugs is pure. This guy, however, is anything but pure. He's clearly, he's ambitious. He's, he's got a lot of impurity, I can tell. Desire. He wants to go from here to here, and it takes him about five minutes. <laughs> mm. 
determined. So when you're down and the, uh, as everybody knows, California is in the midst of not a serious drought, but a colossal drought. We're not a severe drought. We're in the midst of a catastrophic drought right now. And we were standing on the riverbed of the San Lorenzo River. Shouldn't be. <laughs> we shouldn't be standing on the riverbed of the San Lorenzo. There should be water there. We should be underwater standing where we were standing. But there's this much water at the base of the San Lorenzo River. And down there, it's like the reality of this statement is so true because I'm standing in a riverbed and I have been uh, right there in that very same spot in the past where the water was rushing so fast it was ripping trees out by the roots. You know, wow, the force of rushing water that's 12, 15 feet deep ripping trees off the bank. I've seen that very same spot today, rock. And you go, boy. I was there with, with uh, Jinfo uh, with my camera. And it's that river, that the river bed, it's funny, is not a tranquil place. It's a moving place. <laughs> Stuff moves through there. It's, there was not a, it's pure, meaning it's natural. There wasn't a single candy wrapper, cigarette butt, nothing. It's nature, capital N at its finest, but it's not tranquil there. There's movement. It's a place where whew, elements rush, you know, and yet at the moment there's no water. There's that much, you'll see. Very, very interesting. And trees that have been there for 2,000, 3,000 years have come down and their roots are exposed. And you That's a place where the hood is lifted on nature, right? On all dharmas. Like, you can take a look at stuff you don't get to see mostly. You can see inside of how it's working. And how it's working, it's all in flux. It's all changing. The truth of the Buddha's observation that all dharmas are transient, they're changing, impermanent, yeah. You can really see it in that riverbed. Impermanent dharmas. Coming, going, coming, going, coming, going, coming, going, coming, going. And then, with just a moment's hesitation, pausing, you look back and you realize, me too. You know, the last time I was that close to that river, this is the San Lorenzo River. It used to wash, used to float all the redwood logs, logged down there, float them down to San Santa Cruz. You know, and I'm watching, thinking about myself. It's actually in the Sharanga Masutra where King Prasenajit, looking at the Ganges River, and the Buddha says, uh, "Good King, you remember when you were, you know, six years old and you were sitting here." Watching this river? Yes, I do. How old are you now? I'm nearly dead. Yeah, same river, huh? No, it's not. But what's seeing the river? You know, so I had one of those moments. I'm standing there. I was thinking, gee whiz, I was writing my dissertation. That meant it was 2002, 2001 when I was there 13 years ago. And the river, the water was so high. It was scary because it was rising under the bridge. We were thinking the bridge could wash away. And now I'm standing on the rock of that river. Like, but have I changed? Am I different? You know, what am I seeing the river with? And I'm certainly closer to it. But what's the nature of all dharmas? And the answer is Qing Jing, says the Bodhisattva. Pure. Now, it's hard to improve on that word, but we, we tried. We tried... Uh, um, what, was the, what was the one? We said uh, immaculate. It's unstained. Untarnished. Unsullied. I think none of those quite do it. It's um, pristine. It is kind of close. Pristine has the sense of 
nothing's mixed in. Nothing sticks. Right? And yet, everything is changing. It's totally dynamic. What, what you see when you stand, I've got pictures, you'll see it later. When you stand on that riverbed, the, the water has carved out the land. Because the river is down here, but the banks that it's carved is up here where the bridge is. And we're like down here, you know, looking up. And the, tree, the trees with their roots are like like that, leaning over. And you see all the carved riverbank in there. So it's very much like, you know, nature's lifted the hood and you're looking into the engine of where things are going. And take a look. You don't get to see that very often. Mostly we see the, the skin. And it's a riverbank and that's dramatic, but think about it. If you could, if you had a zipper right here and you go and you peel it back and look, first of all, it'd be gross to the extreme because it's smelly and icky and colors and flowing and blood and electrical wiring and rebar, you know, and the name of the contractor and, you know, stuff in there. All of the stuff that's going on under the skin is yicky to the extreme. All inside here, you know, heart, liver, lungs, spleen, and kidneys. We look at the surface and we think Qing Jing means washed, took a shower. Here, Qing Jing means, what was our best one? Not immaculate, not, no, we said pristine, kind of. Pristine, is that the, pristine, yeah. That's kind of, you'd have to use more than one word to get it, which means that nothing sticks, something like that. The self-nature, the inherent, the indwelling, the nature of all phenomena is nothing sticks to them. No attributes accumulate, something like that. Another word, empty. But empty sounds even sillier because clearly this is not empty. There's all kinds of stuff going on. But empty ultimately meaning nothing sticks. Okay, so far so good. How are we doing? A little reality check in the midst of all this description. I say it's a physics text, right? It's a biology text. But it's talking about what? Reality. Reality. So, he, Guan, because this bodhisattva has wisdom, when he or she sits still, or even when they stand up now, because their samadhi is solid, when they take a look at how the world is, they, Guan, they can contemplate how everything around them returns to nothing. The uh, philosophical word that we use is deconstruct. You can tear things down in a single look and yet nothing changes. That's the power of wisdom. You see right through the surface of stuff. Okay, let's try to keep it simple. The bodhisattva goes through the surface of stuff instantly, has microscopic vision, has x-ray vision. The bodhisattva's x-ray vision allows him or her to go right through the surface of stuff and still not be moved by it. Well, would that be helpful? What about when you're in a fight with somebody? When somebody's really trying to make you upset. They really want you to get afflicted and fight back. And if you can see through the surface of it, you just go, oh, it's not me. You're just upset today and you you want company and what you're giving me because I'm your buddy I'm your relative so I'm the one who's getting the attention but what's coming out of you actually doesn't stick to me because I'm not feeling particularly afflicted today so yeah tell me about it you know and that fire that just kind of dissolves because it's not sticking it's not working
You ever been able to do that? You ever been able to stay asbestos nature when somebody's trying to burn you up, burn you down? Not easy, but if you can, once you've ever done that, you know what you feel? Powerful. Powerful. Suddenly, something that was irresistible before, which is somebody else's temper, the person that knows your buttons, that force doesn't jack you around. You just see through it, and it's not that you're tight. You can't move me. No, it's that you really see, oh, no. Yeah, oh, man. You're singing that song, and I don't speak Greek. You know, That's Greek you're singing, and I don't speak it. And you just, you're patient. You're clearly not moved, and the person feels it, you know. And they may try another way, but you go, no, I'm sorry, you're, you know, let's take a walk, or you'll feel better after a nap, or something like that. And that's a profound response when somebody is upset. How can you do it? You see through the surface. You really see it for what it is. And you have no need to respond in kind. That's what it means. That's how powerful it is if you can see the self-nature of all dharmas is empty. Right? Apply it. Apply that insight to your relationships and the world changes. You are powerful because you can't be flipped around by your feelings. How powerful is that? Not that you don't feel but you're not moved by externals. You have a choice. Suddenly you have choice. Oh boy. That's the application of samadhi, which means wisdom, that sets you free from emotional entanglement because why? You genuinely see past the surface of conflicts. Powerful. So, the bodhisattva contemplates how The inherent nature of all dharmas is pure. Ah, now it's starting to take on some depth here. Yes, it is code language, but if your wisdom was this profound, you'd understand in a flesh. Yeah, I know what that's talking about. Sure, I see it. The Buddha's talking about my state. If we're not there, then just park this and wait wait for the time when your meditation gets you there. But the bodhisattvas who are, for whom this is being spoken have got a lot of samadhi at this point. All right. And, sui shun, wu wei. And what does he do? Ah, ki. Sui shun, sui follows, shun, accords with, wu wei, doesn't struggle, doesn't turn against it. How do you, uh, you know the story? of uh, the drunk. This is one of the old Irish stories. Riding home from the pub late at night on the back of the wagon, having drunk, you know, too many pints of Guinness Stout, bitter beer, black beer. Fill them up again, lads. This one's on me. And he just, too many, and... It's on the wagon and it's halfway home and rolls right off in his drunken stupor and lands <laughs> on the road and stands up and laughs and goes under a tree and sleeps it off. The only way he survives without a broken bone and broken, because he was totally relaxed. He, so he hits the ground Oh, that's hard. God, look at that. I think I'll have another drink, please. Yeah, one more round. (sighs) Only because he was drunk could he say, falling off the wagon. (laughs) Literally falling off the wagon. So if he was like sober and uptight, he would have broken half the bones in his body. So, you accord. You flow along with the situation. Why? Why is that? Why does that sentence follow the contemplation of the nature of all dharmas being pure? It's because if you don't sui shun wu wei, you'll go nuts. You can't stand it. What if you saw? Here's an example. There's a um, 
who was it? Where was it? Um, there was a famous... Oh, I know, I know, I know. It's um, Indiana Jones. Um, was it the third Indiana Jones? Which is the Temple of Doom was number two. What was number three? First was the... Um, the was what? Last, the Lost... Raiders of the Lost Ark. Second is the Temple of Doom. The third one was, there's always Nazis, right? In it. So, Spielberg, yeah. So, okay, so there's one famous, it was, this is still in the infancy of special effects. These were amazing special effects, right? Steven Spielberg and uh, um, our man in San Francisco. George Lucas. The famous effect was the, the great Nazi villain ages suddenly. He lifts the Ark of the Covenant. He's not supposed to because when you lift it, you get cursed, all the power, you know. And the camera zooms in and he ages suddenly. In about 30 seconds, he turns into a skull, which then turns into dust, which then, you know. And it's supposed to be one of the coolest effects of all time. Because within, you know, just as the rays of the forbidden taboo arc hit his face, he goes from, you know, fully vital human to, to withered age to skull to dust, you know. And it's like, yeah. But it's a special effect, right? And you see this instant aging. What if, with your ability to see the nature of all dharmas is pure, everything you saw, you could see its whole lifespan. You would go nuts. Start with something simple. We love to see that food on the counter. They talk about presentation, plating food, right? I plated the food. It means you drizzle sauce on top of it and you put some parsley there and it's like so pretty, you know, and you serve it overpriced, big plate, tiny food, you know, and they give it to you and you go, yummy, and you chew it, swallow it down. We don't think about it anymore, do we? <laughs> How many of us go, I wonder what that food looks like now, now that I've chewed it up and swallowed it. What does it look like? I wonder. Let's take a look. I'll bring it back up, <laughs> you know. Yuck. Oh, not okay. Once it goes past here, you don't want anything anymore. I mean, you can wait a while, it'll come out the other end, but that's even worse, you know. How funny that those few minutes, seconds even, before we eat it, it's like, oh, so pretty. Get my phone. I'll take my phone out and send it to Instagram. Ooh, you know, so pretty. But as soon as you chew it, man, don't mention it anymore. Suppose you could see the whole process. Always. Because why? Your wisdom allowed you. It's like, you'd go nuts, right? No thanks. These, these guys, these are so pretty, right? These are very dynamic dharmas. That is to say, their lifespan, their transition happens quickly. They wilt really fast. Outside the monastery, we have these bayulan, these magnolia trees, white magnolias. They're, they do really well in Berkeley because of our Mediterranean microclimate, but they're, they flourish in Taiwan. They're, they're hot weather trees. And those white flowers, they're, you can, these are dynamic. Boy, you've got about a day when they're at their prime, when they just open, and that's when they start to be fragrant. But if you, you could probably sit there and meditate and watch them go. And then they go, and they're gone. And you're out there searching for the perfect moment. And they're all the different stages of tightly shut, slightly open, in bloom, wilted. is about 48 hours. You can watch them. And they're gone. And they're on the ground. Right? They move really fast. What if you saw all things that way? Couldn't stand it. Like the Nazi villain in Indiana Jones as he opens the taboo arc, right? He goes from strength to dust before your eyes. 
What if you saw everything like that? Because everything does. That was one of our topics at lunch today. Our neighbor Wes is a philosopher, you know, and he's big, tall Texan, 70, 80, 76 years old, and was talking about the nature of things, how we all recycle. He says, we all, he said, this is Wesley's quote today, he said, you know, everything, everything out here, everything goes back to the earth. He says, yep, every single thing, look at this, it all goes right back to the earth. Yep, yep, you know that? You know, Santa Cruz Woods, again, our neighbor. It's true. Wesley was speaking this Dharma. We all recycle. Show me one thing that doesn't go back to the earth. Somebody said, well, plastic. Okay, all right, plastic, we'll give you that. Sooner or later, it's still, you know, philosophical neighbors talking about the nature of all Dharmas, how they recycle. Suppose you saw that, like every step. You'd go nuts. You'd think you're crazy. So what do you need? You have to sui shun wu wei. You got to go with it. Because why? You have cultivated a place now where it's not so much that the world is, dec- is changing shape, it's you, the meditator, are changing shape. That's what's going on. The changes are going on inside you, which allow you to see the whole world around you this way too. Right? Perception, how, what are they called, the 18 realms? The Shribajie. There is the eye, things the eye sees, and the consciousness in between. There are six senses, six sense objects, and six consciousnesses. Make the 18 realms. And when you're meditating a long time, this stuff changes. The heat of your meditation makes it all different. It's all different. And this bodhisattva is now in midstream. And the Buddha is saying, hang on, fasten your seatbelt. This is going to get weird. That's what he's saying. Hang on, because it's going to get weird. He sees how all these dharmas are not what he thought. They're not what they're advertised to be. Not. The food that was so delicious that you paid so much money for three inches down your throat is not what you bought, but it is. So now the Bodhisattva sees it for real and has to let it go. You can't attach to the appearances. You can't attach emotionally to what you thought it was because it's not what you thought. Okay. And with that, he can, in this case, ru probably means start. Start along the path of the sixth ground, which is called right before your eyes. That's our new translation for xian qian. Manifestation is a 75 cent word. In English, we say, right before your eyes. Poof! It's happening right before your eyes. Hey, look, it's new, it's different, it's educational, it's entertaining. You won't be late, but you will have to hurry. Hey, look, take one home to little Jimmy. It's appearing right before your eyes. You won't believe it. Okay, what happens next? What happens next is... Patience. Patience happens next. The Ming Li Sui Shunren. The Bodhisattva at this point, the gets gets help. What is it? It's Ming Li Sui Shun. Patience. Two kinds of patience. Ming Li is name and benefit. Ming is name. Li is advantage. Sui Shun, following and flowing. Patience, two kinds of patience. But you stick it with the, the second half of the sentence. Wei De, but he hasn't got Wu Sheng Fa Ren. He hasn't got the third kind. All right. There are three kinds of patience that the Mahayana talks about. And patience is really key for this practice. 
Otherwise, you will not continue. You'll stop. It'll knock you out. You won't be able to do it. Because why? Stuff keeps breaking up under you. Stuff keeps changing. It keeps going away. What you thought you knew, you don't really know. Um, with the advent of psychotropic drugs, of mind-altering substances, we have a whole new realm of reference. Before LSD came around, before psilocybin came around, before uh, you know, magic mushrooms came around, or marijuana, I guess, but it's not the same quite. Before mind-altering substances, um, they have a new fancy name. Scholars talk about them as entheogens, right? God-making chemicals. Think chemicals that put you into God, right? That's the, the academic word for people who are studying psychotropic drugs. Before their advent, it was hard to have an experience where all your senses shift. One example, fever. Anybody remember having a fever so high that you, like, hard things were like water and watery things were like, you know, uh, rubber, where your senses actually changed because your fever was so high? I did, I remember. I had uh, scarlet fever as a kid. And I was really, really young, but I remember that sense of another world. And the problem was you couldn't make it stop. You know. But if you ever had fever dreams, temperature, extreme temperature will make you, you know, you think crazy. And you just, oh, I want an aspirin. Give me a Tylenol. You know, and mom is there with a cool cloth on your forehead. So now that people have had experiences with mind-altering chemicals. LSD was the one that, that hit the, the, uh, the press most readily. But people would take these chemical drugs and everything changed. The, your senses reported different stuff, sometimes interchangeably. Music would come out in colors and sights would turn to liquid, you know. And San Francisco was one of the centers of people boldly experimenting with psychedelics. And so the art that came out, you can kind of get a sense of it in, in some of the posters and the art from the rock bands of the 60s and 70s. So anyway, that's when you realize as you, you know, when these things happen is what my senses right this minute are reporting to me is really like a stack of, it's like a house of cards, right? You ever build a card house? You put one card on the edge of the other going up, right? And you get about three levels up and then it all falls down. Or uh, what else? It's a stack of Glasses. Do you ever stack up glasses in the cupboard and your mom scolds you and then you close the cupboard and they all fall down? Right? Our senses are just like that. They're not solid or reliable. It's just a convention. It's really fragile. Our perceptions right this minute are really fragile. For example, turn the lights out suddenly. If we could make this room really dark, Things are really different all of a sudden because we changed one sense, sight. Or, ima ano nihongo ga hajimete ano hanasu wakarimasen ka? Hmm, zenzen wakaranai yo. Hmm, minna san wa zenzen wakarimasen. Ah, doshite nihongo hanasu kara. What do you say? You know, bojadao. Aiya, tama tingbuji anna. Well, it just changed one little, you know, and then suddenly it's like, wait, something's, what? Hmm? He's not, oh, you know. Doesn't take much. It's really fragile. It's really fragile. Temperature, get a little too hot, ooh, not good. A little too cold, ooh, not good, right? 
our senses are like stacked up on top of each other, around each other. And if you put one teaspoon of sugar in your coffee, and it's kind of sweet. You put ten spoonfuls of sugar in your coffee and it's like poison. It make you sick. So, wow, our senses are really fragile. You have to be patient when this happens. All right. There are three kinds of patience. There's what's called sheng ren, fa ren, and wu sheng fa ren. There's, and the translations are not very helpful. It's patience with sheng, with the coming into being of phenomena. There's fa, there's patience with phenomena themselves. And then there's patience when phenomena no longer are created. Wu sheng fa ren. We've tried our best to translate those phrases, not very successfully, right? Uh, the one patience when dharmas no longer arise is my translation of some variously we've called it the unproduced dharma patience the patience of non-birth like what is the patience of non-birth it means nothing that's just English words pasted on the Chinese so what does it mean these are just exactly what we've been talking about when your meditation gets to a point where stuff is changing what do you do when suddenly your body is really tiny? What do you do when your body suddenly fills the whole world? You're just sitting there. Is Liu is not here tonight. Good old Liu. Liu, uh, Liu has, has been a meditator in our meditation classes forever. She was here. Uh, Liu Lam Fan. Fan. Uh, she was always here for meditation. And Liu... Um, Give her credit, she really did the sits. She really was sitting here. But Liu would always report funny stuff. Whenever we'd say these things could happen, Liu happened first, right? I'm really hot. You know, my body's really hot. Okay, that's good, Liu. Just be patient. Oh, my body's really cold, I'm freezing, you know. And then she would start jumping. She, she was famous for jumping during meditation. Jump, you know. Hey, Liu, sit still. I was just, just doing it, you know. Okay, okay. So then her body got really big and it got really small and then she had somebody killing her, you know, on and on. So um, she wouldn't, she'd laugh if I were, I'm telling stories on her because we went through this for years and years. It happened, these things happened, maybe because she wanted them to happen, we don't know. But they were happening, why? Because she was really sitting. Leo was doing the work. She was actually sitting still. But my job was mostly to calm her down and say, okay, you still have to get up at lunchtime, you know, you still have to go take care of your sister. Just sit still, you know, it'll be, it'll, oh, it'll be over soon. It'll pass. Don't freak out. So I was calming Liu down during her sitting a lot. But she had these states where changes happened. Changes really happened to her body, she would report, you know. And only because, what, she was Yonggong. If she was making it up, we all would have said, hey, quiet, you know, calm down, just go do something else. Don't bother us. But she was really sitting. And it, it could be that Liu's, you know, her uh, skanda, her form skanda, was interacting with her samadhi. Maybe, maybe that's what was going on. So anyway, what happens? Patient. Be patient. What happens when your six senses start reporting things that are weird? Well, Buddha's answer, be patient. What happens when it's not so much you, but it's the world around you? That's dharmas, right? Patience with sheng, with creation, with things coming into being. That's basically self. Your self is different. What about the things outside? Fa. Those change too, sounds, smells, etc. The world, got to be patient. Don't go crazy. Now, I'm going to talk about um, this third one quickly just to give you a flavor of it, but I'm not going to go into it deeply because it, it deserves more. 
But I'll give you a, just a preview of this third one. He's the bodhisattva, he or she is now able to sit through the changes that happen from meditation to self and dharmas. He can empty out the self and empty out dharmas and pretty much be okay with that. But there's a third f- level of phenomena that happens that bodhisattva still can't, can't manage. It's too much of a challenge to sanity. Okay, what is it? It's called wushang faren. Patience when dharmas no longer arise. In the bodhisattva's meditation, sitting there and your own experience tells you that dharmas are neither produced nor destroyed. And you have to be patient with it. Now, what would that be like? What does that mean? It means you're sitting there and you see through the emptiness of everything. You can empty it all out, right? You can see the the purity of their own inherent nature. But then you see that they've actually been there all along and yet they're all empty. And trying to hold that level of contradiction in your mind drives people nuts. In a word, it's scary because it's your experience. It's frightening when this happens. And what do you have to do? Be patient with that. There's a stage where that happens. Where does it happen? The seventh and eighth ground. Up the ladder. Okay, that's one of the hallmarks of the seventh and eighth ground in our chapter is the bodhisattva goes through that gate and doesn't go crazy. It's a real challenge to sanity because why? No, nothing has prepared you for that. You've never heard that before. Nobody's ever talked about it. Nobody's ever explained that before. And you have to, you yourself have to figure it out. Most people don't. They say most people get there and quit. They, they try for a lower mountain. They don't keep on going to the summit. It's too much. But the ones that do, what happens? Buddhahood. In Chinese culture, they talked about the dragon gate, Longman. What happens in the dragon gate? The dragon gate is covered with scales, fish scales. Why? The fish go charging up to the dragon gate, jump, and hit it. Slide back down. Only a few get over the gate and become dragons. Most of them wind up scales on the gate. Right here. When stuff breaks up, it's a challenge to your sanity. Because it's hard to take when sights and sounds and smells and tastes, sensations of touch, and most of all, our sacred, cherished, precious ideas are seen as totally empty. And everything that we thought was true just is a puff of wind. It's like a dream. It's like a bubble. It's like a flash of lightning. It's like a dewdrop. It's like an illusion. Contemplate them thus. Okay, so tough. That's why this is called prajna. If you can handle that and still keep trucking, what do you have? You have compassion. That's why compassion, great compassion, only arises after great wisdom. Only after you empty it all out can you see the true same body, great compassion. Long as we still hang on to a little bit of me and mine, it's not really empty. We haven't made it over the dragon gate. Because we're still clinging to something. It's not easy. It's not easy. Okay.
How is how are we doing? Still like still there? I don't see anybody sleeping. That's good. I see some That's good. That's good. You're still with me. It's easy to check out of this cuz it's like I thought meditation was just kind of like getting peaceful, you know. Yeah, it is, but there's more. All right, turn over to page 8 and 9. The, um, the next section is all about compassion. And uh, there's a sentence at the, at the end of this that is one of the great lines out of the Abhatamsaka. We'll, we'll preview it right now and we'll chew on it all week. This is one of the, the, the real prizes, the jewels of the Abhatamsaka. The Bodhisattva, it's Zuo Shunian. What does he do? He, he thinks this way. He says, Shi jian shou sheng jie you zhao wo, ruo li zi zhao zi wu sheng chu. Right? Everything in the world comes into being because of attachment to the self. Once you get free from that attachment, rebirth has nowhere else to stand. It's like, all right, park that one in your backpack and walk with it. Everything, everything in the world comes about because we're attached to the self. If we can let that go, birth and death ends. That's nirvana right there. What is the Bodhisattva doing? He, she is applying all the insights gained so far internally. He's just taken all, all that like watching phenomena go away, turns it around, applies it to me and mine, and it it goes, it's gone. And there's no more, nothing dies because nothing is born to begin with. And yet, here I am. So there's wisdom and compassion, wisdom and compassion, wisdom and compassion. Prajna karuna, prajna karuna. Chiruhuay tsilbe, chiruhuay tsilbe. Back and forth. The more empty the self becomes, the more you stitch together with everybody. But it's not an idea. This is not philosophy. This is the way the Bodhisattva really sees it. Because they've earned that stillness in their mind through hard, 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 hard work. Got to be patient when your knees hurt. All right, we'll get there next week. Stay tuned for further emptiness. <laughs> Come back next week for more of nothing. <laughs> Don't be late. Dedication of merit. Um, we need to have some place to dedicate. Otherwise, it's it's a good intention, but it didn't go anywhere. So make a wish. Send it out somewhere that you know needs help. Where would that be in our world tonight? Boy, it must be tough being Barack Obama. Imagine if you had his workload. <laughs> Seen his hair? Obama's hair has gone white. Oh boy. Okay, so let's make a wish.
be every living being Our minds as one radiant delight Share the fruits of peace With hearts of goodness, newness and bright If people hear and see How hands and hearts can find in giving unity May their minds awake To great compassion, wisdom and pure joy May kindness find reward May all who sorrow leave their grief May this boundless light Break the darkness of their endless night Because our hearts are one This world of pain turns into paradise May all become compassionate and wise May all become compassionate and wise. Right. We'll do the pictures first, then we'll do the announcements because we have some exciting things going on I want you to know about. Okay, hey, well that is starting up. Here's the San Lorenzo River. I was talking about um okay. Talking about how it shouldn't be shouldn't be like that. shouldn't be able to stand on the rocks in the river. That river is usually up here, right? Okay, there we are. Oh my goodness. That's an old picture. Let's see here. This is what I want to do. And we're going to see a lot of uh, duplicate shots, but
good. So far, so good. All right. Um, here's now that we're here. We go. Ready? Don't, don't, don't get. Uh, use your patience when dharmas no longer arise to look at the banana slug. Hello there. How are you? Hi. Here's looking at you. Here he comes. He lives in the redwoods. There's the redwood. And then amazing critter. Jin Fosher had never seen one before today. This is your first encounter with banana slug today. Right? So I wanted to show everybody the banana slug. There he is in his habitat with the redwoods. These are redwood needles, and he's got these four, six, four, one, four, and a big mouth, and he's this foot calls along. Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz is so weird that they named their athletic teams the banana slugs. That's the name of their mascot, right? There he is. Good eye, Mike. Hey, you. She go to your aunt. Yeah, there he is. So, how cool is that? Now, let's see. I've got a, uh, I promised a movie. Uh, these monks are weird. They show movies of banana slugs. Somewhere. Uh, here we go. I'm able to do it this way. JPEG. Worf. Worf. Move. There. Got it. Ready? And they're off. I go slow, but I go long, he says. I got my eye on you. Both of them. Fascinating, huh? Or not? Just gross. I don't know. Yick. Here he comes. I mean, look, he's covered inches since we started the film. He just keeps rolling. If you watch him, they actually cover a lot of ground over time. Not in a hurry. You can't be in a hurry. So, um, okay. Now, let's, we want to go, there we go. This is our bridge. If you go to Highway 9, our property, you go over this bridge. We were, all of this is built to keep it from falling down. Here is the river bed. That is two inches deep. The water goes up here. There, see what the water has done? These trees, you can see their roots. The water has washed away. This is, these are redwoods that have fallen into the river because their roots have been washed away by the, by the rushing torrent that is no more. There we go. Standing in the river. Shouldn't be standing in the river. But we're in a drought right now. There are salmon used to, <laughs> when this is at its peak, right? And um, 
Okay, check this out. You're looking at redwood roots. Because the water goes up there to wash them away. Talk about movement and impermanence. Look at these trees. Can you dig it? Those are redwoods. Those are the oldest, tallest trees on the planet. And the water has revealed their roots. But look where it is now. There. <laughs> so, change, huh? I, I find this fascinating. See how transition. And standing in that riverbed, you feel the movement. It's not tranquil. There. It's dynamic. Whoosh. This is about as elemental as you get. Oh, now there's a whole bunch of banana slug pictures here, which I'm not going to bug you with, no pun intended. But let's move on here. Yeah, back. There we go. I didn't get a chance to edit these before we came down, but so uh, yeah, banana slugs. Well, they didn't all load up. Uh, let me do this. There we go. What a landscape. Elemental, there. That's a good desktop. I might import that as my desktop. The light, this is uh, at 9.30. The light is coming in from the side, slanting in. Very beautiful. When the, when the river is higher and burbling along, it's really different because when it's quiet like this it's silent there's not much noise look at that bank the nature of that river is noise as well as movement yeah three friends the other thing about redwood forests is the light is green it comes through the trees it's a green light because the trees are up here. There's very little sky. You can't really see the sky because of the trees. So the light is all filtered through that. Um, so here's our, here's our gang. This is uh, Wesley, the ph philosopher neighbor from Texas. And there's Nam. Nam is not, not attacking him. It's okay. We're, or defending himself. Notice that Wes has got a hammer in his hand. Maybe that's what Nam is after. So. No, no, that's not what's going on. You're trying to help him. I, you, that's what you say, but I can tell. And that's it. There we go. Yeah. So, Wesley is uh, 
uh, 76 years old and uh, was telling us about his diet, how he's cut meat out of his diet, cut sugar out of his diet, and dropped 23 pounds and uh, works all day. All he does is work. And he says that's what keeps him alive is, is the work. So. Here is Guoji being liberated from a jail where we stuck him for hours and hours. No, no. Guoji is in there under the bridge putting in these railroad ties, railroad trestles in order to keep the bridge from collapsing when the heavy trucks roll over it. So these are some talents. But uh, most of us would look at these spider webs and that's as far as we'd go, right? <laughs> oh no, under the bridge? No thank you. But he just keeps working. Please let me out. Let me out. No, I'm kidding. So these, this crew works really well together. A bunch of Dharma friends working to, as they say, Yonghu Dao Chang, protecting the monastery. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? Right, here we go. So here's... Uh, There's a keeper. Let's see. Yeah, that's a good one. Ah, uh, here's Eric. You get to see Eric for the first time. There's Eric Jia. These guys work well together. There's our bridge. Okay, so down to Santa Cruz. This is the first picture of my mother. Nineteen thirty one. High school picture. fashion show and some of you will remember this scene 2003 No kidding, Tam. Oh my gosh. 11. 11. 2003. Isn't that something? Really? Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she wrote that article, right? That's great. Yeah, I, when you sent that along, I really appreciate that. Great. All right. Okay. Uh, and then picture of my dad. This is a different world. What is the story here? Here's my father. Right here. His name was Jamie. This is his his dad, my grandfather, with the pipe. This is my father's younger brother, Freeman and older brother, Don. There's a bear. Canada. This is Quebec. Notice it's snowing. Look at what they're wearing. This is before the days of down parkas. But if you're in Canada, in Quebec, you're tough. They go out with three, three wool shirts on with their rifles. My dad's got his Winchester repeater. <laughs> And Uncle Don's got a bow tie on, and they've caught this, killed this bear. The hunting party. Growing up in Canada. 
Notice the snow is falling as the picture is taken. Yes, indeed. Okay, thanks, and then we can bring the, the screen back up now. Okay, um, we're going to turn off the... Do it. Now, um, what I said was we have, just a second, let's get rid of that. We have lots of interesting stuff going on, which includes um, a Thursday night class called Introduction to Buddhism and Meditation. And uh, Jin Chuan Shi is leading that one, and uh, Jin Fosher. You want to say a word about that? Can you come to our Friday class? Uh, we have a, a sutra lecture, and we have a Saturday night class, and it's on Avatamska Sutra, it's on emptiness. <laughs> and they're kind of, I, we, we see them kind of come in and kind of go out, because um, it's this long series of classes, and they don't really, they're just kind of starting out. And so one of the things we thought would be valuable just to have some basics of Buddhism, kind of just explaining just the fundamentals. So we went over, for instance, last two weeks ago, the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha's life story, and just give people some pointers on meditation so that when they come into the meditation here or come to our classes, a, a regular series of lectures, they at least have some place to start from. So it's not like they're coming in completely new. So that's that's the spirit. And, and um, I think we have a couple of us who participate in the class together. And we try to make it very engaging for a, a young modern person. And if, if people are the elder young modern person as well. So it's a, it's a good class. And it's in English. And it's in English. Yeah. yeah. So uh, now, is this one about meditation? or is This one will be meditation. The upcoming one this Thursday will be on meditation. And we're still figuring out what the format is. Um, we first thought we were just going to do it as needed, as people were requesting it, and we could just kind of repeat the cycle. Or we might extend it, depending on what people like to do. Yeah. Okay. And the time and place? It's Thursday night at 7.30 to 9 o'clock. And it's every other night because it's alternating with the round table. Right. That we're round having. table is on what, like two September and four? September 11th. Yeah, September 11th. Fourth. Yeah. So and yeah. The basics of Buddhism and meditation is first and third. Yeah, so you can see it on the posters outside. It's down the hall in the dining hall. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, that's answering a need. Um, also, Tuesday night, there's a special event going on, which is a. Uh, it's a group that came together not as Ahimsa, not as Spirit Rock or any of the others, but it's, it's just a group that um, formed out of a conversation about technology and our lives. The co-conveners are Tom Mahon, M-A-H-O-N, friend of the monastery, myself, and a man named, a Catholic monk named Jerry Caprio, and his father, his father Jerry, and Nipun and Service Space are also taking a big role. So it's for people who want to talk about how technology touches your lives. And it's, 
we go from big to, to from macro to micro. It can be how everybody is like married to their phone now, and it's just like you know you, you're never more than about 12 inches away from it all day long, all night long. And Apple just announced the Apple Watch, so it's getting more as uh, Tim. Who? Tim. Cook said, intimate. Technology has become more intimate and more personal, meaning it's on your wrist. It's not even like your phone, you can set it down. Your watch, you keep on. So the next step, we will remember maybe in our lifetimes when technology was inserted surgically into your body. Right? Where it sounds silly now, watch. Yeah, wristwatch. Right. Watch. We will now have, you know, it's going to be a real palm top. Hello? So, that's technology is getting closer and closer to our actual physical carbon-based system. Anyway, that's the conversation. It's a really interesting conversation. Please come. No prior requirements. Even if you're not an engineer, you can come and benefit. 7.30 Tuesday night. We meet here in a round table. So that's another event. It's not it's a special event, it's not on the calendar. We probably won't do it again, but we might if people get interested in it. How does technology impact your life? Especially spiritual aspects, technology and spirituality. Otherwise, Stephen Tainer's Wednesday night meditation class, uh, Spirit Rock, East Bay Insight group, as usual. Uh, Friday night's Marty's lecture on the Six Patriarch Sutra. Tomorrow, Sunday, anything going on? Kind of an interesting event, but we had been having people know there's Guanyin recitation sessions at the City of 10,000 Buddhas three times a year, and so people are very welcome to join that. So our our latest session, people were so excited from the retreat that they wanted to get together again to do a to to practice some more, and so the spirit of the, the so we call it a Guanyin reunion. So in the conversations, um, Doug was actually going to come and, and lead some of the discussion, and the, the was, idea was for people who've actually done a Guanyin session before to sign up and then come together so that people have a shared experience of cultivation to to speak from and seeing how they've integrated their lives from after the Guanyin session um, in their everyday life. So that's happening tomorrow. So it's actually, um, it's kind of been a sign for, for people who've come to the Guanyin sessions in the past. So if you're interested in the future for things like this, definitely you can talk with myself and we can uh, kind of point out when the Guanyin sessions are happening at the City of 10,000 Buddhas and, um, and kind of get you connected. Yeah. Okay. Good. Are we all primed for next Saturday's lecture? Key, prajna, karuna, compassion and wisdom, how they interact. Get rid of the self and the world falls apart. Yippee! Don't you love Buddhism? It's all suffering all the time until it's not, and then it's just weird. Right? But if you can be patient, suddenly it's more than that. It's wonderful, again. So, you have to be patient. Okay, let's bow to the Buddha. See you next week. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master.
Why